coming to you live from Oracle Code 2018 in Chicago. I'm Bob Rubart with the Oracle Developer Community, and my guest is Vincent Chianese. Vincent, how are you doing? All good, thank you. You just uh, wrapped up your session. Tell me a little bit about what you talked about. The whole point of my presentation was uh, what are the challenges that you can face if you're going from a monolith architecture into a microservice archi based architecture? Because, you know, often the elevator pitch of the microservices are mostly like you can scale your application independently, you can deploy in the way you want, and it's all true. But on the other hand, uh, microservices are bringing a complete new set of problems, and I want to show the guys ahead of the time what you can be challenging with if you take such a decision, so that you at least have a baseline to think Maybe it doesn't really make sense to me to go to microservices, or maybe it does. Yeah. That was the whole point. How do those challenges, those microservices challenges, differ from similar parallel challenges in conventional service-oriented architecture? The thing is that, first of all, I mean, the session was in particular focused on moving from monolith to microservice. Right. So, and in general, um, legacy is hard in all the way you want. Right. But in particular, uh, the, the new challenges I see is that when you go with the microservices, you kind of want to use the network as an application bus. Mm. But unfortunately, the network is unreliable and is not meant to be an application bus. From that, a lot of, a lot of things that you don't think about can challenge. For example, if you have a particular transaction that is happening on multiple microservices, what do you do if one of the services in the chain is failing? Do you roll back all the previous transaction? Do you retry? How do you handle this thing? And also, how do I make sure that those retrying logic don't get coupled into the services themselves? How can I separate the way I want to handle the errors on a layer that it's not influencing my services at all? And that's one of the challenges. Where should I put the things? That's was kind of the baseline discussion I was having with the guys. How does using the RESTful architecture and an API gateway help to overcome those challenges? The API gateway was particularly useful because it is acting as an integration layer for your microservices. So it's something that you put on the edge of your system and it's doing some checks for you before sending the request to your internal service. And with this parting, your service is getting some guarantees because, for example, if a request is hitting my service, it means that, for example, the user is authenticated and is authorized to do such action because an API gateway has been verifying the things for me in a declarative way, not writing code. And it doesn't matter how many services I have, the, the gate API gateway is going to check all the requests and route those for me. This thing, for example, helps, helps me to avoid duplication of the code among the single microservices. Mm -hmm. And then using the REST, in particular, implementing an hypermedia API for the services, I can decouple what is the affordances that my system is offering from the way the microservices are being arranged. For example, if I, for some reason, I want to melt two microservices together, using an hypermedia API lets me to offer the same affordances, and it doesn't matter if I have another URL space. Do you have a layer of indirection provided by the Hypermedia API that lets you say to the client, I want to do this action? And then the server implementation detail is going to figure out how to route the request, where to send it. So this two combination is, I think, and I show it live, was the key to to overcome those things. For example, and at the end of the presentation, I was switching in real time between the microservice-based architecture and the monolith, just one time, every single, every five seconds, the implementation was switching. The client was not breaking because the API gateway was, was making sure that the authentication was happening. And this indirection layer provided by the Hypermedia API was kind of masquering the, where the request was going at the end of the day. You mentioned that at the end of your session, you spent a great deal of time answering questions from the audience. What were yeah. some of those questions? Most of them, for example, were more like, uh, we already have a solution to this problem, for example. Like, uh, you know, GraphQL can be an alternative to the Hypermedia API because it has this introspection mechanism that it's built in, so I can see the affordances ahead of the time, I can react, and it is true. It is absolutely true. 
but maybe GraphQL is, it is forcing you to have a particular mental model. Mm -hmm. The good thing about architectural style is that you choose the constraints that you want to apply into your system to get some advantages and renounce into something else. While GraphQL is more like all of nothing. So if you cope with their decision, it's gonna be a great fit for you. But maybe, and especially with legacy system, you cannot afford to make a complete switch. Maybe you want to do in a something in the middle in meantime. And, and I think REST fits perfectly such a thing. That was one of, one of the most uh, asked questions I had. What can you tell me about the Express Gateway project? So Express Gateway, it's an API gateway written in JavaScript, and I am the main maintainer. It's sponsored by my company, and uh, the development is, joy is, uh, is an effort between my company and Joyent. We decided to build an API gateway in JavaScript, although there are other solutions for sure. There is Kong by the guys of my shape, there is Thick, and so on and so forth. Kong, for example, it's written in Lua, and you will probably agree with me that it is not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, on the other way, uh, JavaScript is way more spread and a developer, especially maybe front-end developers, are more willing to dig into the source code that they can understand. Mm -hmm. And using Express as a baseline, let us leverage the whole and huge uh, ecosystem we found around. So basically, everybody that is writing a middleware for Express can be plugged in into Express Gateway without any effort. So uh, we are leveraging a huge range of packages for free and they are uh, handling a lot of use cases. And we also find out that most of the people writing web application in Node.js, in a way or another, they were all always implementing their own API gateway. So we said, why not just put all this knowledge in a declarative way uh, so that the people can uh, focus on the service instead of writing such a thing. And where can people find more information about Express Gateway? So we do have an official website, is www.express-gateway.io. We have a Gitter channel, we are extremely responsive, we have a GitHub repository, I mean, we're following the good open source rule, and we will be more than happy to help you during the journey, or if you have any testimonial of using EG in production, we'd be happy to also to promote the content eventually. And what's the name of your company? Go ahead. It's, it's Lunch Badger. Okay, yeah. Lunch Badger, yeah. I love that name. Vincenzo, thank you so much for taking thank time you to for talk having to me. me. This has been fun. Again, Vincenzo gave you that URL so you can get more information on Express Gateway. If you'd like more information in general, visit developers.oracle.com for all sorts of content, articles, videos, podcasts, and so on for developers, by developers. Thanks for watching, stay tuned.